Thanks for tuning in to Scar Stories. Today, we continue with our series, Invisible. We'll be meeting some brave people in this series, victims of homelessness, prisoners, foster care survivors, and today, we'll talk to Delyn Westbrook as she shares her narrow escape from human trafficking. Her story is an eye-opening testimony to the brokenness that creates this industry and the wounds that keep people in it. Today, Delyn is a devoted wife, new mom, and soon-to-be graduate. Here is her story of how she turned everything around. Check this out. Hey, you guys, welcome to Scar Stories. And I'm so excited about our next guest that I'm going to be interviewing today. Her name is Delyn Westbrook, and she is a friend of a really good friend of mine. And she's had just an amazing journey. And she really encompasses um, one of the issues that I will want to talk about during the series, Invisible. And that is kind of this whole area of human trafficking. So before we get into that, though, we're going to do an interview with her today. And I just want to introduce you guys to Delyn. So Delyn, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for doing this with us today. We're so excited to have you. And um, I just want to hear your story because I know you've just been through so much and you have turned your life around. I know you're a sales manager now. And in fact, when we spoke earlier, I know you were actually getting an interview to even get a promotion, which is so awesome. So we're all going to be praying that you get that. So that's very awesome. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us your story. And, you know, we're doing this whole series on invisible, which is people who are people who have kind of been victims of some difficult things in our world, the things that we don't think about, you know, um, we've talked about uh, homelessness and people being in prison and things like that on this show. And you, you've had kind of an experience that's unique. And why don't you just tell us a little bit about how you got involved? Okay. Um, so it really started when I was younger. Um, so the kind of like the background of my household story, um, my parents were divorced when I was three and my mom remarried. Um, so when she remarried, as I started growing into my preteen teenage years, um, the marriage got a little worse. Um, so there was a lot of physical, mental and emotional abuse between my parents. And I was kind of like left out in, you know, witnessing it and everything. Um, so I think basically I was just seeking love in wrong places. So I started kind of adventuring out and meeting older men. Um, and I would often run away when I met one, I would run away. And sometimes I'd be gone weeks. Sometimes I would be gone just 24, 48 hours. So, um, there's going to be, there was one time that I was actually gone for a couple of months and, um, I met an older gentleman. He was in his seventies. Um, he was actually a multimillion. He was like, he was a millionaire. And, um, so, you know, he did things to me and it kind of brought out that world. Um, eventually, you know, I got, um, caught up by the police cause I was called in as a runaway. Um, and at, you know, this time I'm 14, 13, 14. And, um, so when I was called in, I ended up going in probation, going to a rehab. And, um, when I got out of that, I was doing those narcotics anonymous meetings. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, en and I ended up meeting a guy at, by this time I'm about 14 and a half, 15. And I met a gentleman who was in his early twenties and I started dating him. So I was just dating him and we were going out to movies and my mom didn't really say anything. I think she was just happy I was home and I'm um, doing good. And, um, but during dating him, uh, he started kind of using drugs. And so one day I was over at his apartment and I guess that you could assume it was the drug dealer that came over. Mm -hmm. And, um, I got upset about everything him using and putting me in this position. And he, he started calling me names and that drug dealer actually knocked him out for doing it. But mm -hmm. little do I know in my heart, I was like, Whoa, he respects me. He likes me and all of this good stuff. And, um, he actually asked me to come with them. And so I did, there was another girl in the car when I got in there or when I got into the car with him, there was another girl in there. So for just for a couple of months, you know, he was whining and dining me. I didn't have to do anything. Um, he would cater to me. She would go for some reason. She'd go and she'd bring in money and whatever money she got. Of course, he was just, you know, there was nothing I didn't want or, you know, and he would give to me. So that's what happened. Um, after a couple of months of that, he finally told that girl that I was ready. 
And so, um, you know, I'm like I said, I'm like 15 and I didn't really understand, but she did uh, take me out into the streets. Um, We'd get into a car and she would explain to this person that picked us up that I was new and um, in that I had to have the money. And so when I got the money, then she didn't do what I had to do. Um, we got out of the car and I would hand, of course, the, um, the pimp, the money. Right. So after so long, this becomes like a normal way of life, right? This is just now a lifestyle. Um, so when I was about, so, so it just continued on and on. Um, when I, and this started in Seattle, Washington, because that's where I'm from. Um, but around 18 years old, uh, the gentleman that um, was pimping me out ended up going to jail. And it wasn't for that. He got caught with drugs. So um, I ended up meeting another gentleman because in this lifestyle, there's kind of just a circle. So it's easy to kind of just fall back in and meet somebody because you only hang out with a certain type of crowd. Right. Sure. Um, so this person happened to be from Detroit, Michigan, and he talked me into coming this way. Um, to see his family, quote unquote. Um, So I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll drive you over there. We'll drive. Um, So he had a, he had a car that he rented from some guy and we drove and, you know, I don't remember exactly what happened, but um, he ended up leaving me here. We got into a big argument and I've, I've never was from here. I never been here before. And he left me on gross back in eight mile right by that strip club. Uh-huh. I had nothing. I just had the clothes on my back when I mean nothing. Well, I didn't have an ID or anything. Anyways, um, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have nothing. So I'm standing on this corner and I'm crying and, you know, this car pulls up to me and, you know, I did only what I knew how to do. I got in, I got some money. He dropped me back off and um, I just started crying again. And this girl walked up to me and she said, and I explained to her what happened. And that I only have this little bit of money. And she's like, oh, I have a car at the liquor store. I have a driver. Mm-hmm. So I kind of fell into that, got into the car. We ended up going to a hotel, um, which now I know is in Livonia. Um, and we got to a hotel. I walked in. And there's, you know, a guy in there smoking weed. And mm-hmm. there's, you know, three or four other girls there. One's on a laptop. And I kind of from there just got exploited. Um on the internet, didn't know, you know, I still, I knew the street life a little bit, but not too much. I was still really, really naive. Um, from there, you know, the, the pimp would beat me. I, you know, I remember trying to sneak away from him and one of the girls told him where I was at and he came and kicked down the door to the motel and literally hit me once. And, um, my eye was swollen shut. He did take me to the ER. I had like five fractures on my cheekbone, like, So it just kind of continued and continued on. And um, I don't, you know, I was with him for a couple of years and I don't know how I got away, but one day we just part and it was, it was amazing. (laughs) I I got away. And, um, but like I said, the circle still goes because now I am literally five, six years deep in this game, game of life or whatever in this trafficking. And, um, And so now it's my norm, just as if another person gets up, wakes up, brushes their teeth, gets ready to go to work. Like, this is my norm. So, um, and I knew nothing else. And so I ended up meeting another guy down by eight mile John R area, um, was with him and he acted like he wanted to take me off the streets. And, uh, it was kind of like a different kind of trafficking. (laughs) So he acted like he loved me, wanted to take me off the streets and, you know, um, when he had, he was selling drugs too. Um, so when he had clientele that he wanted to entertain is when I would come in, but I wasn't walking the streets or on the internet. Um, he kind of kept me to himself. Um, well, you know, one day I just, I kind of got fed up and I, um, I left and he ended up calling me and kind of reeling me back in after 24 hours. And I kind of, I came back. Um, I, remember walking through the door. I was happy to see our puppy that we had. And I go into the back room, was hugging the puppy. He walked back there and started stabbing me. So, um, during, and this is, you know, where the redemption of Christ comes in. And when I look back, just the hand of God and, you know, 
um, it takes my, so if I cry, it's more just because of his goodness more than it is about the story. So, um, I cry all the time. (laughs) You're in good company. Uh, Yeah. So it's good. So, you know, he's stabbing me and, um, my leg was in the air and he went to hit me and I felt my jaw snap. So as he's dragging me over the bed, I remember waking up to him, kicking me, telling me to wake up. And um, he just started hitting me. But why he was dragging me, which it wasn't probably maybe like five feet away from the bedroom to the bathroom. As he was dragging me, it was the first time I ever prayed. Um, I was just like, you know, Lord, don't let me die. And like a peace came over me. Hmm. Um, And so he went and started filling up the bathtub and actually tried to drown me. So why he was trying to drown me, um, he was 200 pounds or better on top of me. Um, the only way I could take a breath is if I snapped my clavicle bone in half. And so I kind of just did that and had my head pressed against the wall and just snapped it so I could get breath. And, um, somehow I went into the bathtub and the doorbell rang and it was one of his friends. So right there is when the cycle stopped. Um, his friend came in and saw, but he quit beating me and quit stabbing me because he was stabbing me in the head. I had many stab wounds um, and so forth. And, you know, after that, I laid in like my own blood. I just kept bleeding out and um, was catching really bad infection after two or three days. So he finally was like, um, if I allow you to lay here, you're just going to die. And he took me to the ER while driving to the ER, he asked me if I was going to tell on him. And I just shook my head because I couldn't talk. <laughs> oh. um, and he dropped me right off there. And after that, I went in. My jaw ended up being wired shut. I was in for about a week. Um, and, you know, again, my clavicle bone, actually my hand, because he smashed my hands with hammers and was hitting me with hammer that, um, you know, I had shattered bones in my hands. Um, so... From then, he picked me up from the hospital, and I was there for a while with him. But then when he found out I was useless, he let me go. Um, So, again, I returned to the only thing I knew. Even you know, um, I couldn't move my arm. I was probably a hot 85 pounds. My jaw was wired shut. Um, Poor thing. Yeah, that's that's kind of what happened. Um, And that happened and continued for, like, two years Um, Until one day I got pulled over by the police and um, got arrested. I had a good amount of drugs on me. I got arrested. And um, that was my journey. I like I went to jail um, and was walking around this metal table. And again, I was crying. And that same weight came off me, that piece. And I just never been the same since. So, um, you know, and I was just praying and praying and that's, that's how I know the power of God is real. And, you know, even in the middle of the story, I kind of just gave a broad. There's not, uh, there's not where I didn't give detail about days that I was raped four times in one day, one by a police officer. Um, you know, I was knocked out in back of alleys and just taken advantage of. Like, I've been raped so many times that it's normal to talk about, like, it's almost a normal occurrence, right? Um, to where in society, you think of a woman getting raped, you're like, whoa, but that was like supposed to be okay. So, Mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, that's my, that's my story. Wow. You've been through so much. (laughs) I'm so proud of you though. Look at (laughs) at you now. You're about to have a promotion. I hope so, so, but that's that's (laughs) the Lord. (laughs) I know. God is good. Yes, he is. Yes, well, yes. Thank you so much for opening up and sharing with us. I know it's probably yes. not fun stuff to think about. And I just, nope. <laughs> wow, what you've been through so much. And I just, I hope that anyone who is hearing this today knows that, wow, if Delyn can survive this, that there's hope for you too, because this is really, what an incredible story. And I just, I'm so glad you're okay. I mean, that's just, yes. what a, what a difficult thing to have to endure. I can't even imagine. And you're still like, you're a beautiful girl. So I know thank you're you. a right lady. <laughs> I can tell, and you're smart. I can tell that too. That's awesome. Thank you. You know, Delyn, as we talk about this, obviously it's so um, just heartbreaking to hear what you've had to endure. I mean, you know, when we think about this issue of human trafficking, I mean, you, you kind of touched on at the end there about how people think because maybe you've gotten sucked into this life that somehow you deserve to be treated. Like, I mean, even a police officer taking advantage of you. I mean, that's like, there's like this mentality where, 
people, people think that you deserve it somehow. And it, which is so messed up, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, really- yeah, you, you, you get that and you get that a lot. And, you know, a lot of people think it's, you know, I happen to come from a broken home and I was really just seeking love, but as a 12 year old and a 13 year old, that's getting molested by a 70 year old, you know, that's, you know, I didn't ask for that. That's a kid, right. Right? right? You don't ask to be raped in 18 years of your life to be robbed from, you know, you don't ask right. to, you know, go and they, you know, I, this is where I thank God and give him glory because when you, when you surrender to him and, and you give your life to him, everything's made new, but I was robbed of everything. Like I was robbed of experiencing a prom, a first date. Like my husband took me out. My husband, I have He's the one that took me out on my first date. Like I was robbed of that. You know what I mean? And I was robbed of having a baby naturally because I've been raped so many times. There was damage to my organs that I had to go through IVF. Like, and, and like I said, God creates and remains new, but I was robbed of that experience. Mm -hmm. I didn't see my family for 18 years. My mom went through hell, you know, wondering where I was at. You know, my dad went through cancer And I didn't even know wasn't even there to support because it literally has robbed my mind. And when somebody's in that lifestyle, there is, and it's hard to explain, but you're not aware of life around you. Sure. Like you're going to work, there's school, you could have a beautiful life. Like this is what it is. Every day you get up, you get money because you're afraid to even be raped. Like that stuff becomes natural. Right. It's just natural. Right. Um. And so, yeah, and it doesn't necessarily have to be of a broken home. I have a friend right now who's 24, who his grandpa was a pastor who it raised in a, uh, a beautiful home, all with love and got sucked in because she met the wrong girl when she was up here on vacation. She's from South Carolina. She's 24, met the wrong girl when she was 19 that introduced her to the strip club life. Right. Mm -hmm. And somebody that's weak or doesn't have the confidence or I wouldn't even say weak, but maybe there's something missing a hole. And when you meet that person, it kind of fills it. And, or there's just deception there because we do have an enemy that seeks, kills and destroys. Mm -hmm. And she gets sucked into that. Well, right now she got sucked back into it and she's in the hospital fighting for her life. Literally, they just removed like parts of her brain. So, um, you know, and that's what I mean. It doesn't matter what your life looks like, right? It doesn't matter if you grew up in a healthy home. It doesn't matter if you grew up in poverty. It doesn't matter if you grew up in an abusive home. You know, um, the guys out there know, know what you need and know what to look for, right? And as a woman, we are full of emotions. Sure. Yeah, so just doesn't matter it comes in all walks of nature and that's and that's the thing it's just right nobody asks for that and that's a really important point because i think so many times we have stereotypes of what we think you know a certain type of person that gets sucked into this and you make a great point because it really doesn't matter because if you've got that void as a woman where you don't have good self-esteem or you're you know you didn't have a dad Mm -hmm. that maybe was telling you that you're pretty and you're smart and all these things that we need as women you know from our dad right and it's like that creates this void. And if God isn't able to fill it because you don't know or you're not pursuing, you know, that relationship, then you really are susceptible to a predator situation exactly. where someone comes in and can totally take advantage of that because yeah. it feels good to be loved. And even if it's yeah. even if it's dysfunctional, sometimes a dysfunctional situation still feels it gives us that sense of belonging, even though it's not the right type of quote unquote family. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's almost like it recreates a a street family for you, but obviously yeah. it's dysfunctional and abusive, you know, but it just seems to be after so long. So that predator knows how long it takes, you know, they know yeah. what tickles your fancy, right? It's always nice to get nice gifts. It's always yeah. nice to be felt like a princess, right? Because in reality, usually one has to work for, to get some, you know, to be able to, get their own stuff like that. But when things are just given to you, especially when you're young and the way society is built on now looks on fashion on, you have to have this, if you don't, you know, um, Gucci belts, whatever, like when that's given to you and you get brought up to that class and you're feeling and thinking some type of way. And that's when that world worldly thinking comes in, you know? Um, and 
that's that's where you have to be careful because one, then you have sex with this person and you think you build a relationship. Well, I'm sorry, but I, you know, if you don't have sex with somebody, it's easy for you to say goodbye. Right. But when you do and you share that bond and that and your spirit becomes one, you share a soul tie and that's what happens. And so there's some emotional attachment there and um, you get sucked in, you get sucked in and they know that. So Right. It's, it's, yeah. It's against it doesn't you. matter where you come from. It right. doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. Oh, well said. Yeah. There, that's well said, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I have a question for you, you know, and you're, this is so great what you're sharing. You know, I love, I love where you're at now. Cause I can tell you've done so much healing and thinking about this of like, why, you know, of why yeah. this could happen, you know, to someone, you know, and there's, there's a lot of shame attached to something like this, which I know has probably been hard, you know, which is one thing right. I love about how brave you are to just, just be so honest and open with us today. You know, what do you think? Um, why do you think that is, you know, why do you think it's important that we share these kind of stories? Because it, it is one of those things that people don't, you know, people don't want to talk about this kind of stuff. You know, they just don't because we don't want to, emo- we almost want to, it's better to almost turn away and pretend this doesn't exist. Like we're, we're almost more, we almost more easily talk about drug addiction and alcohol addiction, things like that, than we do human trafficking or, you know, the whole issue around that and sex crimes. You know what I mean? And I know that's getting less the case, but what are your thoughts as someone that's endured what you have? So one, I think the way why people look at it that way is because again, society is built. It's that person's fault, right? Right. That they got sucked into it. But let's be honest. There's, there's nothing to be ashamed of, especially when you come out at your victor. So there's no more, it's not any more victim. Like, and that, and that's the thing that I want people to realize. Why is there shame? Because people in society has built this culture to where if you've been molested, if you've done drugs, if you've been raped or, or you've been trafficked, like this brings you to like a certain level of class. Like there's no class right. in it. Like that is what life is brought. But for someone right. that has went through this, and I don't care if it's addiction, I don't care if you've been molested or it's been trafficked or you've been beat throughout your whole life and you don't want to bring that in because people look at it in a certain way or may look down on you or actually just be pitying you, which is even worse. Like, um, people don't want to come out with that. And it does. It brings you like to a whole different class, you know? And I'm just like, and I can, and I can understand that. You know what I mean? Um, like I felt, you know, um, there's times that I've done speaking events and I've, I've seen people's face like, whoa. Um, and there just be kind of like pity or like not, they're maybe not understanding. And it just, you know, to them, they look at me totally different than they would look at me if I didn't say any of that. And what I'm doing now with my life, you would think, okay, so she's, a, she's successful. Right. But <laughs> you bring that in. It's like, whoa. You know, and um, so I can see why and and people don't want to be defined as what they of what they've been through. Right. Like that doesn't define who I am as a person. And so when people and when people um, allow and open themselves up to the things that have happened to them, then somebody else is going to look at them in a different way. So, you know, and and that's and that's why people feel shamed. Um, But I got one up on everybody. (laughs) <laughs> that feels that way. Listen, because I know Christ, and and right. so and so that's that's different. When he when he died for me, I found out who I was. Like I'm a I'm a daughter of a king, the Most High. Like he has right. turned my life completely around to where it feels like I have never lived that, and it took more than half of my life. So right. so for that, and that's where you know a lot of that needs to come in. If somebody has and is listening and has been through this, and you might not know Christ and you know, I encourage, and I don't do this because I'm not a Bible thumper. I'm not religious. Like <laughs> I have experienced right. it all that, that yeah. you dig in deep and, and you seek him, like give your life to him. And, it's, and, and that's what I say, because you will not know shame anymore. You just won't, right. Right. you won't, you will not know shame anymore. And you will not care what another thinks because you're set at pursuing Christ and caring about what he thinks. Right. more than anything. So, well, I think that's one of the greatest things about our faith is that there's yeah. an offer to change your life. 
and to be yeah. leave the past behind, whatever it is. And, and, and there's, and our past and our mistakes do not have to define us. And I can't agree more yeah. because I think, and I think that's such a truth of all of our human experience, no matter what we've been through, because we've all made mistakes and we've all gotten sucked into things that we've made bad judgments. It's just, you know, they might vary. And we, we like to give things categories, don't we? As people right. like, well, this is the super big, awful thing. And then like, right. this isn't so bad, but you know, it's all bad. It's all stuff that's damaging to us and separates us from God's love, you know? So it's like, you know, like, you receive him. so it's like, I totally get that. And it's, that's a really, I love the way you said that. And it's, it's true, you yeah. know, and I think that's why it's important to share these stories because I think the more we can normalize talking about this kind of stuff, it actually helps because even though this is something that you went through, it can also be something that becomes, uh, part of your story, obviously, and part of your yes. message of hope for other people, you know? Yes. Awesome. Um, do you know, do you think that, um, you know, one of my questions I had for you that I was, I was kind of curious your thoughts about this is, do you think there's different types of human trafficking, like voluntary or involuntary, like, or do you think at all, I mean, cause I know like even in your story, you sort of got sucked into it and it was probably one of the, I'm guessing even what you said, it's almost like you get in a situation where you're so dependent on people for your life because they're, you're, you know, they're supplying, you know, money and food and shelter and all that stuff that if you don't sort of go along with it, even if you don't feel comfortable, like I'm sure you had moments where you were like, well, I don't think I really want to do this, but like fear not to though. Cause now you're in this situation where if I don't go along with this, like what's going to happen to me. So like, um, I think, you know, that's a good question. I think that somebody going into it, uh -huh. um, if you think quote unquote voluntary, I don't think it's ever voluntary because you never waste your life to it. Like if you really know the impact it's going to take from you and rob you of, you wouldn't go into it. Right. Um, and that's, and that's the thing. So is there voluntary and involuntary? you got girls that go into strip clubs, right. Sure. And, and, and dance, but that's like the culture, right? That's right. the culture saying, hey, this is cool. It's cool that you have a big butt, shake your thighs, whatever, make money. And then guess what? If you want to go into the room and see this guy, you can get paid with that too, right? right? So you have different and still that's still trafficking because it doesn't matter you're paying for sex, right? So it doesn't. And and so there is there there's there's a difference, but there's not. And I just feel like, um, that's when it comes to human trafficking, there's one way you have been coerced somehow manipulated somehow to be doing what you are doing sooner or later. People think it's voluntary because coming with that comes drugs, right? It just comes with the territory. I used to love getting high because when I got high, whoever was on top of me, I wouldn't think about if I didn't have drugs before I was having or before I was having a date with a John, I would literally be sick to my stomach. I would close my eyes and squint really tight and just want it to be over. But when I when I was I would do drugs before my date and I'd be so numb to it that it just didn't matter. Right. And that's you know what I mean? And so sure. but whatever I had to do and that would be the importance of having it. It wasn't like. It wasn't like I really loved the high, but I loved that it numbed me sure. because I, you know, it made you, because every time, because yeah. every time a guy would touch me, it made me want to vomit. I would just cringe. Like I hated it. I, I hated it. And I hated how they only saw me for one reason. So I just don't think that when it comes to real human trafficking, mm -hmm. it's involuntary, the voluntary where you kind of go into it will be like the strip club type thing. And yeah, in a way it is trafficking because whoever owns that strip club is making a profit out of you. So, sure. you know, but that's going to be like, and, and and yet you still have pimps that choose to do that route versus you walking the street or go, getting on the internet or, you know, doing it that way. So it's just, it's really different. It's, it's different levels of it, I guess. Right. No, that's, yeah. that's a really good answer. I appreciate your candor with that because it's, I think it's such a big issue because I think we tend to minimize some of that stuff. Like it's not a big deal. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it, I think when it really comes down to how it feeds into this attitude towards women um, in our society, it's not yeah. helping, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's really not helping, you know, cause we, and, and, and it is, there's a lot of different victims to this and it's, you know, you don't think about that side of it, you know, and it's, yeah. 
know, cause there's even movies now that glamorize, you know, strip clubs and, the yeah. whole thing. and it's just, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool. Right. You can make yeah. a grand in one day. It's cool. It's, it's cool till something happens. <laughs> right. Right? right. Or it, it's cool until your, your body's perishing because you're 40 or 50 years old and your body's perishing because you're older and now you have no education, nothing to fall back on, you know? Um, and then you're just, like I said, you're just, you're, you're letting your soul be eaten from the inside out dealing with that kind of stuff. I don't know. It's sure. just, uh, yeah, yeah. I, agree. I hear you. I hear you. No, that was a great <laughs> answer. That's a great answer. Dylan, what do you think the hardest part has been? Oh, you got your kitty cat. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is great. <laughs> uh, that's so cool. For those of you who can't see this or just listen, <laughs> show us her little kitty cat. He's so cute. <laughs> uh, what do you think the hardest part has been, Dylan, of recovering from this? Um, actually, you know, I've actually been pretty, oh, sorry, my phone cut out. (laughs) Okay. Um, so I've actually been pretty blessed. Um, you know, there's some hard parts and it could be, um, season changes. Those kind of trigger me. Um, so the different smell of the air. Um, I know when fall hits and it, and it happens, you know, how fall has like a, and it's my favorite season too. Um, I love to decorate. I always feel like there's a tree in the backyard turning red and I feel like decorating. Um, so, but no, let's not get off track. So just, uh, (laughs) just the smell of the air can trigger me. Mm. Um, certain seasons I made more money. Certain seasons were a little more wilder than usual. Um, snow snow I could be driving down the street and just maybe the way that street looks with the snow in it reminds me of the days that I was out there in a short mini skirt freezing um Mm -hmm. so that kind of thing can trigger me um so dealing and and I don't know what really triggers me till it happens like I said I've been pretty blessed a lot of Mm -hmm. you know and and that's where my faith in Christ comes in because um if it wasn't for him, I probably would be a little more psychologically damaged, like, mm-hmm. and didn't know who I am in him and what, and what is new. Right. So, um, and I, and I've learned to forgive everyone. Cause he says to whoever's harmed you, you just forgive them. And so I, like I said, it's, I don't really know what triggers me until it happens. Um, like one Sunday I was, um, filling my gas th- or my gas tank up, and I was on mound. I feel like mounted 13 mile. And it was just the amount of traffic that was out that Sunday morning and just kind of the feel of like the weather, the climate that day that it literally almost put me into a panic um, because it, it, it felt like as if I was back out there. And so like I, I had to call my mentor and I just had to be like, whoa, this is really weird. I don't usually do. I don't usually get these. So it hit me out of nowhere. Right. And so those are the kind of things that I have to deal with. Otherwise, you know, I'm blessed. I'm going to school. I should be graduating by the end of this year, early yes. next year. Awesome. Um, and, you know, I just had uh, my first little guy and he's eight months. Uh-huh. And yeah, awesome. and I'm married. So there's so oh, much okay. good, but there is, there's little things like that, that trigger. And, you know, I'm blessed because the rapes didn't affect me the way some, it may impact somebody different, you know, um, there are certain PTSD like things that can occur, but I have to, I realize that that's what it is. So you kind of push them away because the enemy has no control over me. And so you're not going to use that. <laughs> that's what it has right. to like realize, right. but there is, if there's somebody that comes at me in a, um, aggressive manner, um, I have a wall that kind of just goes up and I'm in fight mode because, you know, I did a lot of fighting and you had to protect yourself. And, and so those kind of like things, my heart just kind of thumps and I'm just like ready to go in, in, in rage. And like, I have to realize that that's not what I like. I don't have to fight in this situation. So a lot of that. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. That's, that's amazing that you're, able to overcome it like you are. And it, it does speak volumes about your faith. Cause I've got to believe God has healed so much of that for you, which is great. Yeah. You know, and that's, Take, you taking know. it away. It's almost, it's almost like I've never lived it. It's almost like, like I've only been, mm-hmm. it's only been six years, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it's literally almost like I've never lived that life. Wow. That's yeah. Amazing. That's yeah. so cool. 
That's awesome. <laughs> well, you know, I, I have just a couple more questions I want to ask you. This is so great. I love what you're sharing. It's so inspir- inspiring, you know? I mean, this is this question is just kind of an extension of what you're, you're sharing right now. I mean, what has, if you had to like have a takeaway from this, what do you think this experience has taught you? Because I know everything that we go through, we know, and it's sometimes hard to understand like why God allows us to go through certain things. And what do you think your takeaways for this? Because I'm sure this is going to be probably part of your story for years to come that you can use to inspire people. Cause I know that that's, you know, how can it not, you know, cause it's so inspiring. What do you think this has taught you though, how it's changed you as a woman, as a, as a Christian, as a person? Um, I wouldn't even say anything as a woman, um, God's salvation. Yeah. I think that if I didn't go through that and I'm going to cry because, um, if anything, I pray, I prayed before this, if anything that I can get from anybody listening and who may not believe with all of my heart, I pray that you do. I pray that you give this a chance because it's not, it's not about um, traditions and religion and, and thump, Bible thumping and all this. It's a literally a serious relationship. And I now know the true meaning of salvation and the way that it has changed my life first if I just went to rehab and got sober and, you know, and it had to depend on the counselor um, right. once a week to get me through that week, you know, I don't have to do any of that. And so what it has taught me or what I have realized or came in revelation is the true salvation of Christ. It's the true salvation of Christ. There's no way I have seen so many women who have gone back who never gave their life to Christ, who would try to go to rehab and do Narcotics Anonymous and do all of this and, you know, try to break away and just return. And, you know, and and when I really got taste of the goodness of God and his mercy and grace on my life, I there's no way you can, you know, and that's that's the only thing that I've gotten out of this is his salvation, the true the true experience of it. So. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I love that. I love that. And I feel the same. I feel that I have to make me cry. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, it comes from a real place and I love that. And you know, it's, it's true. I mean, once I think God's love does change us, you know, we all have a different journey and it's like, and sometimes it takes that. Sometimes we have to be, you know, really at hell's door to really realize that God is real. You know, I, I will often share that with people myself is, is that, Maybe they're struggling with believing in God, but it's like, look around. Do you believe in evil? Because if you, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it's, it's like, it's funny you say that because it's not even about like when people think of believing in God, you think of literally like, you think of those people that come and knock on your door in like suits and ties, right? <laughs> Trying to talk like, that's right. how I think of it, right? right, right. The, the things that make me cringe, right? And right. that's literally not what it is. It's not, right. it's not that. And that's the image when you think you should believe in God, that's the image that pops into my head that would pop into anybody's listen. I am not that type of person that's in a black, right. black and white outfit, suit and tie um, knocking right. on your door. Listen, I'm literally telling and saying it's, it's a relationship that is so powerful that you can go in at your weakest moments and you can pour out. I can come to God about anything and it could be simply as cooking a dinner. Make sure I don't burn it. I want my husband to eat it. Like, <laughs> and he sees me through it and it's crazy. It could be simple as, you know, um, I know that I had no education. I've never worked a job in my life and God has gotten me from an office associate to an office manager, to sales support into a showroom. Like, and it just keeps going. That's not me because to be honest with you, I, um, I can't even write like a paper for school. Like (laughs) I can't ever express or communicate what I truly mean unless it's something that I've experienced like now, but when it comes educationally, I was robbed of that, but he's gotten me through it all. And when it's just been supernatural each time that, you know, I don't care as, as, you know, as we have our, our fellow friends and listeners, you know, I'm just saying, you know, uh, don't miss out, don't miss out and don't miss out on the option to walk on golden sidewalks and never shed a tear again. Like don't miss out on that. Right. Yeah. Amen to that. That's yeah. Awesome. yeah. That's so awesome. That's awesome. You won't be, you won't be joining a cult. It's nothing like <laughs> <You're> that. <right. laughs> 
No, that's amazing. Well, you're such a, you are glowing. And I, I so appreciate the way that God has changed your life. Cause I just, I, you. I relate to it. I've had that experience myself. So I get it. Thank it's you. awesome. So, and I'm sure you'll inspire people that are listening today. And, you know, before we wrap this up, I just have one more thing I want to ask you about, you know, like, if you had some, some kind of advice for us today, and especially as it relates to this issue of, of what can we do to stop this issue of human trafficking? Like if you, if there was something that we could do to help or to make this situation better, um, in your opinion, with what you've been through, what do you think um, would change? Like, I know it's kind of a broad question, but. Love. You have got to love everybody. It doesn't matter. You don't know what your snippiness, your rudeness, your rolling of the eyes, you don't know what that does to a person. And they may not be trafficked now, but if you're going by them and making fun of them and they hear you or you disrespect somebody because they're not of your class or they're not, you know, anything like that, you don't know what that pushes towards and what kind of seed that plants. And if you are driving and you're in an area that you're driving through and you see a girl or a woman standing out there um, and you know what they're doing, or even as somebody that's homeless, you know, a lot of homeless women were trafficked at one point in time. And, um, of course, gained an addiction through it all. But now they're so old that they're worthless to a pimp. And that's where they end up because that's they don't have anything to fall back on a job, an education that was robbed of them. Now they have an addiction. Now they have nothing right to fall back on. So that kind of thing to acknowledge that and just a gesture of love, love will always plant a seed. And, you know, and, and, and that's the thing. It's relationship. It's love and relationship. So if you happen to be driving and you have a glimpse of this one and you want to build that relationship with them and just come check on them once in a while and just really know their name, that's mm-hmm. another thing that really that can make a big difference. So I love that. That What a great way to wrap this up. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I love what you shared. Dylan, thank you so much for doing this with us today. I'm so touched by your story and I so appreciate you opening up and sharing what you've been through and you're so inspiring. And thank um, you. We, are, we are wishing you all good things with your future. I know that you're going to be a huge success. You already are. And look at the changes <laughs> you've made and you've got a new little baby and a husband and a job. And that's so great. You're going to be finishing school. <laughs> It's awesome. Yeah. I'm really proud of you. Girl to girl. I'm really proud of you. It's awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thanks All right. for our stories. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Scar Stories. You know, if you're inspired by this podcast, we would love it if you left us a review. It helps more people find the show and lets us keep doing this for you guys. I also wanted to invite you to be part of our Scar Stories Facebook community. You can find the link in the show notes. Starting this fall, we're going to have live Q&As and a chance to meet some of our awesome guests. I hope you'll consider joining us. 